What's up, what's up? This is Jacques and today we're talking about building remote teams. What's up, what's up? Today's question comes from the homie Kasim Swain. And the question is, Jacques, how would you go about building a remote team? Now, for those of you who know me and my story, Back in 2012, I graduated college, and instead of going for a full-time job or an internship or something like that, I got an office and started building a company. I was doing it with my wife, and we built that office from the ground up. We went to YouTube, learned how to build floors and paint and all that stuff, right? Fast forward to 2016, we had a team of 10 working out of three offices, Brooklyn, New York, upstate New York, and Los Angeles, California, in Hollywood. 2017, just one year later, we closed all three of those offices and moved our team to 100% remote. Now, we see this pattern from a lot of different companies. You know, we have companies uh, like Envision, you know, you have companies like GitHub and WordPress, and a lot of these very popular companies that we know about today who's running operations fully remote. And then you have companies like Yahoo and all others and Google that has semi-distributed teams where most of their team is in an office, but some of them are remote. Now, the reason I built my office a couple years ago was because I felt like I needed to do that for authenticity, to actually build the brand. But fast forward to 2012, it's a whole different time. So the question is, how would I go about building a team if, it were, if I had to do it today, more specifically a remote team? And here's how I go about it. So the first thing is, you gotta create an organizational chart. Now, um, this is the same for creating any team, whether it's a remote team or, or not. An organizational chart is your way of knowing sort of who you need in your organization and what you, what you need and where they go and things like that. For example, um, if you're a wedding uh, photographer, right, and you're the only, you're the solopreneur, you're the only one who works at that company, if you need to hire somebody, the next probably most important role for you is probably an assistant photographer. And let's say you have an assistant photographer who helps you in these weddings. If things are going well and you need to hire somebody else, the next best hire for you is probably going to be maybe somebody in finance, a finance manager, or an executive assistant to kind of manage the bookings, the payment, and that kind of thing, right? If your business was a marketing agency, then it's different. Based on your specialty, let's say your business was, you are a SEO web company or a web development company, let's use that, right? If you're a web company and you're a developer yourself, your next immediate hire after yourself may be a designer to help you design the websites or a copywriter to help you actually write the copy that's going to go on all websites, right? So by creating an organizational chart, you can kind of lay out who you need in your organization for it to be successful. And you can also pinpoint the order of when you need to hire these people. This is important for those who may have the money to hire somebody, but they don't know who's next. Creating something like that will help you really prioritize who you need to bring to the company. So the first thing is create an organizational chart. The second thing is, it's important to identify the type of employee that you need. Now, there are five types of employees that I, that I, I think um, are worth talking about. Full-time employees, part-time employees, interns, contractors slash freelancers, and the last one is a co-founder, and I'll share more about that later. So. Full-time in all these different roles, there are they're, they're the positives and negatives of all these different types of employees, right? So in the case of a full-time employee, the positives are you have their attention, you have them full-time. They're solely working on your business and you know they live and breathe your business. They may have some part-time stuff, but you're the main thing they're doing. Uh, there's a high chance that they have went to school for this or they have some level of experience to be able to qualify for your, you know, having to work for you full-time. The negative of a full-time employee is that they're probably the most expensive out of all the different uh, types of employees that I mentioned. In addition to like traditional payment and things like that, you probably need to uh, invest in health insurance, an actual office space for them to work. Well, in terms of like a lot of companies like us, we uh, pay a stipend to our team to be able to find coffee shops and co-work spaces to work. So that's something else. And if not, you may need to invest in uh, furniture. You know, some companies that work have remote teams, they invest in furniture so that their employees could have an actual work area in their home. So if that's the case, an employee, a full-time employee has, uh, those are some of the negatives, right? 
A part-time employee is relatively similar to a full-time employee. The negatives are about the same in the sense of like, you gotta pay for health insurance maybe, depends on you know how many hours they're working, all that kind of thing. Um, and another negative about a part-time employee is that they're not working for you full-time. So they may have other things going on, you're not their only priority. And that's important, especially if you're a startup or a small business that you know you need all the attention you can get, you need all the hours, all of the brain powers that you could get, right? So that's the negative of a part-time employee, but some of the positive of a part-time employee is that they cost less money than a full-time employee. And that matters, because if you need somebody who is gonna be about your brand, who has experience, but you may not be able to afford a full-time person yet, part-time may be the way to go. Now, the third type of employee is an intern. Now, an intern has positives and negatives as well. The negatives of an intern is that, you know, they're probably going to be the least experienced out of all the different types of employees I just mentioned. Why? Because interns are in school or they're doing this to learn. But the benefit of an intern is that they'll probably be the best option as it relates to cost, right? Because some internships can get uh, college credit and that's, and, you know, that's enough payment for them. Others, you give a little stipend for lunch and transportation, that kind of thing. And others, even if you do choose to pay them, it's just not required that you pay them as much as you pay a full-time employee, right? So that's the, that's the uh, if you choose to go the route of an intern, that's what that is. The third one is contractor slash freelancer. Now, a contractor and freelancer is um, probably has been one of my most utilized type of employees over the last few years. And I'll explain why later. But a contractor and freelancer, um, you know, kind of I put them in the same uh, boat. The positives are out of all the different types of employees I just mentioned, they're gonna have the most experience. They've been doing it a lot longer. They probably have their own business, their own thing going on, and they're giving you a helping hand. Another positive is that you're getting almost like full-time employee level of uh, experience, maybe even more, but you don't have to pay things like health insurance and give, you know, cause they have their own operations. The negative is one, you're not the only client. So you will not, you know, you're not gonna be priority. There's not, you know, there's a high chance that it's gonna be you and maybe 10 other clients and they're juggling their time. Um, so turnaround time is gonna be a little bit slower, right? And they're also gonna be relatively pricey. They're gonna be pricey for a short period of time. So that's something else to keep in mind. They're most expensive, I think, per project, but long-term, uh, they're beneficial because if you're only working for a project, they make a lot of sense. And last, and, and definitely not least, I think a lot of us don't think about another type of employee is actually getting a co-founder. You know, I was fortunate that my wife and I were co-founders of our businesses and it made things a lot easier because I was working 25-7 on the business, but when she joined, she was also working 25-7, right? So now we have two people working 50, yeah, you do the math, right? All right, 50, 40, whatever. Anyways, right, so a co-founder, don't sleep on co-founders, man. So like, whatever you do, especially if you don't have the money to afford a full-time employee or any of the ones above, it's important to try to find somebody who is, has been doing it, who has some experience to be a co-founder or who can complement the skills that you don't have. The negatives of a co-founder is that you know, you give up percentage on ownership of the business. The positive is that you're getting, you potentially getting contractor level of experience without spending, uh, you know, a lot of money for them because you guys, you know, depends on if it's 50-50 or 60-40, whatever. But regardless, it's important for you to identify the type of employees that you need. Now, the third thing is finding candidates for each of these different roles I just mentioned. Now, there are tons of resources out there. I'm not even gonna waste my time on all of them. I'm just gonna share some of my favorites that I've used over the last few years to get each of those different type of employees. So when it comes to finding contractors and freelancers, um, there are a lot of sites out there, a lot of the usual suspects. Uh, it's important for you to figure out the type of contract that you're looking for. Is it creative? Is it tech? Is it development? Is it um, an administrative assistant? Because that will determine the platform that you use. I've used a combination of Fiverr, Upwork, uh, and even online jobs at PH for different needs depends on what it is. And the thing about a contractor is if you're looking for somebody in the States or out of the States, those platforms I just mentioned can help you with, uh, with all of those. If you're looking for an intern, I say go to the universities, create a relationship with them and then they'll be able to feed you interns, especially if your business is one that you need interns consistently. You can make sure you have a new intern per semester by actually having a relationship with the school and it helps them because now they have a place to place their students so they can learn and get experimental credit, experiential credit. And for you, you get 
you know, you get help from somebody that you can choose to pay or not. So I say go to the school for interns. Uh, for a co-founder, I would say go to networking events. Go to networking events that are that are specific to the industry that you're in. I think that's the best way that I've found people who have became partners of my companies are people who are like mine. And the best way to find those people is by going to the events that people who's in it, who's interested, who has an interest is actually gonna go to. So find networking events, tech conferences, whatever it is that like-minded people would go to and start networking from there. And lastly, full-time and part-time employees, the best way I'd go about finding those people is social media. That's been my, you know, more specifically Twitter and LinkedIn. Those are the two platforms uh, that we've used successfully to find the right candidates to fill all of our jobs full-time and part-time. So that's the third thing, and that's how I would go about actually finding the candidates. Now, the fourth thing is um, creating the right processes within your organization for success. And that's important, because you can't just hire people and say go. It's important for you to actually properly learn how to manage a team, how to build a team. So it's important for you to educate yourself to know how to create these processes. A few good books to get into uh, to, that can help you with this is The E-Myth Revisited, one of my favorite books, read that book once a year. Um, uh, what else? I would say uh, The Checklist Manifesto, that's another great book. It talks about you know checklists and things like that. And I'll also throw in, um, I'll throw in The 4-Hour Workweek by Tim Ferriss. It's not exactly what we're talking about, but it's a great book, I think, about prioritization and, and kind of like whenever you're delegating tasks and stuff like that, I think it's a, I think it's a good book for that. And then I'll probably throw in uh, How to Win Friends and Influence People by Dale Carnegie. Uh, one of my favorite books of all times, read that book every single year, uh, maybe every six months, if anything. Um, just about communication, how to communicate with your team. So I, I, I fit all of that under building the right processes. And the last and certainly not least, which I actually think is probably the most important piece here, is investing in the right tools to build your to build and manage your remote team. Now, I'm partnering with WebEx to help educate entrepreneurs and small businesses on how to build and run remote companies. And you know, within their their program, they have a lot of products that fits all the different needs of somebody who's building a remote team. They have a um, they have a Teams app that helps you communicate with your team. They have a meetings app. They have calling app for having phone, uh, you know, being able to uh, call out and have those conversations. So I, if you get a chance, I say go to webex.com and check out some of their offerings because they have some phenomenal tools that I think could help you and your businesses as it relates to in, uh, integrating software into your process. Because without software, it's not gonna work. So those are my five things, which is create an organizational chart, um, uh, figuring out the right type of employees for yourself, you know, and I shared also thirdly the ways I go about finding those candidates. Three is, uh, fourth is creating the right processes. And last and certainly not least, investing in the right tools, the most important one. All right, that's my answer. Peace.